Everything is Mark's fault. Mark's fault. It's all Mark's fault that it didn't work. Everything is Mark's fault. Hello? Hello, we're back. <laughs> this is Cog's Corner. I hope you are all seeing me. Uh, something went wrong. <laughs> something went wrong here. Um, and I did a workaround because the original way doesn't work. Uh, I am here today. First of all, welcome. This is Cog's Corner. I'm reading Harry Potter every single day for an hour. I've never read it before. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, thanks for your patience, everybody, for waiting. I'm here with Mark and H H Hillary. Hillary, Mark's girlfriend. <laughs> and um, also Dexter. Where's Dexter's cam? Oh, yeah. I, well, I was trying to fix it. I used uh, the, the phone that I use for Dexter's camera. So I'm just going to pop that up there for all you Dexter freaks. Um, so that you can see see the little guy and, you know, say aw and ah every five seconds. <laughs> okay, here we go. You can't even see it. What is going on? Everything's going on. Who cares? Who cares anymore? I don't care. We're just going to read Harry Potter. How about that? Um, thank you for your patience. I'm going to throw this on and we'll get started right away. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's not even working. Like The camera's gone for some reason. Working. Dex cam? Uh, who cares? We'll just have a good time. I'm alive. Yes, I am. And the deduct points from Mark's house. I did nothing. Okay? It was all Mark's fault, really. He stumbled in here. All the the wires got tangled up in his feet. Screw and he, he pulled the whole like computer fell over. I had to rebuild it in five minutes. It's like, come on, Mark. <laughs> You're on camera. Oh, no. Oh, no. And, oh no. Yeah. Oh, oh no. That was the look of death. I'll deal with you, baby. I don't even tr I don't trust myself to look over to my left anymore. Good. I don't trust myself. Okay. Let's get started. Um, so what happened last time was uh, Hermione spoke out in class against Umbridge. Not even spoke out. She just said uh, about the stuff that they were learning. My opinion is, yeah, the, the counter jinx is just a nice word used for jinx. That's all. It's just a nice word to use. And then uh, Umbridge said, you know, you're not, he, your opinion doesn't matter. And Harry spoke out against her, so he got even more detention. A full week's detention. So, uh, reading will make you feel better. It always does. We can still see the lasagna on the side of your mouth. What lasagna? I didn't even eat any. We know what was really happening. This is what happens when you, when you re-enter society. Lol's lasagna gate. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's get, uh, let's get started here. Lights, camera, action! The cut on the back of Harry's hand had barely healed, and by, the and by the following morning, it was bleeding again. He did not complain during the evening's de detention. He was determined not to give Umbridge the satisfaction. Over and over again, he wrote, I must not tell lies, and not a sound escaped his lips, though the cut deepened with every letter. The very worst part of this second week's worth of detentions was, just as, just as George had predicted, Angelina's reaction. She cornered him, she cornered him, just as he arrived at the Gryffindor table for breakfast on Tuesday, and shouted so loudly that Professor McGonagall came sweeping down upon the pair of them from the staff table. Miss Johnson, how dare you make such a racket in the Great Hall? Five points from Gryffindor! But Professor, he's gone and landed himself in detention again. What's this, Potter? Said Professor McGonagall sharply, rounding on Harry. Uh, on Harry, Detention? From whom? From Professor Umbridge, muttered Harry, not meeting Professor McGonagall's beady, square-framed eyes. Are you telling me? She said, lowering her voice so that the group of curious Ravenclaws behind them could not hear. That after the warning I gave you last Monday... You lost your temper in Professor Umbridge's class again. Yes, Harry, Harry muttered, speaking to the floor. Potter, you must get a grip on yourself. You're heading for serious trouble. Another five points from Gryffindor. But what? Professor, no, Harry said, furious at this injustice. I'm already being punished by her. Why do you have to take, uh, to take points as well? Because detentions do not... Uh, do not appear to have any effect on you whatsoever, said Professor McGonagall tartly. No, not another word of complaint, Potter. And as for you, and as for you, Miss Johnson, you will confine your shouting matches to the Quidditch pitch in future of, uh, or risk losing the team ca uh, captaincy. 
Professor McGonagall strode back. Yeah. That's a bit unfair. I, th I think that's a bit unfair. Right? Do you think it is? I don't know. Not really. No? No. Just on top just on top of Umbridge's stuff too? I mean, I guess well, she, she did warn him. She said, like, don't. Yeah. Just keep it quiet. Yeah. And she knows better. But he's speaking out, as should she. I don't... Uh, but she, I she's... Didn't get, that's probably the last five or six minutes that I missed. Because my phone died. Oh, right. Okay, okay. So I don't even know what the argument was about. It was, it was nothing, really. See? It was nothing. He's dumb. He's being dumb. Yeah, 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 that's true. And somebody who really cares about him to just shut up and deal with it. Yeah. And she has power over McGonagall, too. Umbridge does. Yeah. Right? Point, because of this yeah. evaluation. Yeah. Everybody on edge. Bit harsh, McGonagall. Yep. Umbridge, why why you always lying? Why you always lying? I gotta get that on here. <laughs> She's protecting Harry. She's got a point. She does. I do agree with her view on this. All right. Where were we? Professor McGonagall strode back towards the staff table. Angelina gave Harry a look of deepest disgust and stalked away, upon which he flung himself onto the bench beside... <laughs> okay, Mark. <laughs> onto the bench beside Ron, fuming. <laughs> uh, who, who did this? Ron. She's taking points of Gryffindor because I'm having my hands sliced open every night. How is that fair? How? I know, mate said Ron sympathetically, tipping bacon onto Harry's plate. <laughs> that is such a, such a great friend move. <laughs> She's bang out of order. Hermione, however, merely rustled the pages of her daily prophet and said nothing. You think McGonagall was right, do you? said Harry angrily to the picture of Cornelius Fudge, obscuring Hermione's face. I wish she hadn't taken points from you, but I think she's right to warn you not to lose your temper with Umbridge said Hermione's voice, while Fudge gesticulated forcefully from the front page, clearly giving some kind of speech. Harry did not speak to Hermione all through charms, but when they entered Transfiguration, he, he forgot about being cross with her. Professor Umbridge and her clipboard were sitting in a corner, and the sight of her drove the memory of breakfast right out of his head. Excellent, whispered Ron, as he sat down in their usual seats. Let's see Umbridge get what she deserves. Professor McGonagall marched into the room without giving the slightest indication that she knew Professor Umbridge was there. That will do, she said, and silence fell immediately. Mr. Finnegan, kindly come here and hand back the homework. Miss Brown, please take this box of mice. Don't be silly, girl. They won't hurt you. And hand one to each student. <laughs> said Professor Umbridge, employing the same silly little cough she had used to interrupt Dumbledore on the first night of term. Professor McGonagall ignored her. Seamus handed back Harry's essay. Harry took it without looking at him and saw, to his relief, that he had managed an A. Right then, uh, right then, everyone. Listen closely. Dean Thomas... If you do that to the mouse again, I shall put you in detention. Most of you have now successfully vanished your snails, and even those who, uh, even those who are left with a certain amount of shell, have got the gist of the spell. Today we shall be," <laughs> said Professor Umbridge. "Yes," said Professor McGonagall, turning around. Her eyebrows so close together they seemed to form one long, severe line. I was just wondering, Professor. <laughs> Sorry. I was just wondering, Professor, whether you received my note telling you of the date and time of your inspection. Obviously, I received it, or I would have asked you what you were doing in my classroom, said Professor McGonagall, turning her back firmly on Professor Umbridge. Many of the students exchanged looks of glee. As I was saying, today we shall be practicing the altogether more difficult vanishment of mice. Now, the vanishing smell... <laughs> I wonder, said Professor McGonagall in a cold fury, turning on Professor Umbridge, how you expect to gain an idea of my usual teaching methods if you continue, if you continue to interrupt me. You see, I do not generally permit people to talk when I am talking. Professor Umbridge looked as though she had been slapped in the face. Oh, she did not. Oh, oh, 
She did not speak, but straightened the parchment on her clipboard and began scribbling furiously. Looking supremely unconcerned, Professor McGonagall addressed the class once more. As I was saying, the vanishing spell becomes more difficult with the, with the complexity of the animal to be vanished. The snail, as an invertebrate, does not present much of a challenge. The mouse, as a mammal, offers a much greater one. This is not, therefore, magic you can accomplish with your mind on your dinner. So, you know the incantation. Let me see what you can do. How she can lecture me about not losing my temper with umbrage, Harry muttered to Ron under his breath. But he was grinning. His anger with Professor McGonagall had quite evaporated. Professor Umbridge did, did not follow Professor McGonagall around the class, as she had followed Professor Trelawney. Perhaps she realized Professor McGonagall would not permit it. She did, however, take many more notes while sitting in her corner, and when Professor McGonagall finally told them all to pack away, she rose with a grim expression on her face. The Umbridge voice is such a turn-off. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's one of the books, but not the first. The House Cop. <laughs> All right, um, where are we? Okay, she rose with a grim expression on her face. Well, it's a start, said Ron, holding up a long, wriggling mouse tail and dropping it back into the box Lavender was passing around. As they filed out of the classroom, Harry saw Professor Umbridge approach the teacher's desk. He nudged Ron, who nudged Hermione in turn, and the three of them deliberately fell back to eavesdrop. How long have you been teaching at Hogwarts? Professor Umbridge asked. Thirty-nine years, this December, said Professor McGonagall brusquely, snapping her bag shut. Professor Umbridge made a note. <laughs> Very well, she said. You will receive the results of your inspection in ten days' time. I can hardly wait, <laughs> said Professor McGonagall in a coldly indifferent voice, and she strode off towards the door. Hurry up! You three, she added, sweeping Harry, Ron, and Hermione before her. I like, uh, uh, McGonagall's just the best. She's just so, she knows what she's about. She, she does have a good heart. She's got a tough exterior and she don't take nothing from nobody. That's what I like about her. Harry could not help giving her a faint smile and could have sworn he received one in return. 39 years. 39 years, that's true. He had thought that the next time he would see Umbridge would be in his detention that evening, but he was wrong. When they walked down the lawns towards the forest for care of magical creatures, they found her and her clipboard waiting for them beside Professor Grubblyplank. Uh, you do not usually take this clap. Oh, wait, who, who are we talking about here? Umbridge, they walked down the lawns. Harry heard her ask. Okay, sorry, I thought Harry was saying to somebody. You do not usually take this class, is that correct? Harry, her Harry heard her ask as they arrived at the trestle table where the group of captive bow truckles were scrabbling around for wood lice like so many living twigs. Quite correct, said Professor Grubbly Plank, hands behind her back and bouncing on the balls of her feet. I am a substitute teacher standing in for Professor Hagrid. Harry exchanged uneasy looks with Ron and Hermione. Malfoy was whispering with Crabbe and Goyal. He would surely love this opportunity to tell tales on Hagrid to a member of the Ministry. Hmm, said Professor Umbridge, dropping her voice, though Harry could still hear her quite clear clearly. I wonder. The headmaster seems strangely, re <laughs> seems strangely reluctant to give me any information on the matter. Can you tell me what is causing Professor Hagrid's very extended leave of absence? Harry saw Malfoy look up eagerly and watch Umbridge and Grubbly Plank closely. Afraid I can't, said Professor Grubbly Plank breezily. Don't know anything more about it than you do. Got an owl from Dumbledore? D w uh, got an owl from Dumbledore? Would have like a couple of weeks teaching work. I accepted. That's as much as I know. Well, shall I get started then? Yes, please do, said Professor Umbridge, scribbling on her clipboard. Umbridge took a different ta tack in this class and wandered amongst the students, question questioning them on magical creatures. Most people were able to answer well, and Harry's spirits lifted somewhat. At least the class was not letting Hagrid down. Overall, 
said Professor Umbridge, returning to Professor Grubbly Plank's side after a lengthy, lengthy interrogation of Dean Thomas. How do you, as a temporary member of staff, an objective outsider, I suppose you might say. How do you find a Hogwarts? Do you feel you receive enough support from the school management? Oh, oh yes, Dumbledore's excellent, said Professor Grubbly Plank heartily. Yes, I'm very happy with the way things are on. Very happy indeed. Looking politely incredulous, Umbridge made a tiny note on her clipboard and went on. <laughs> And what are you planning to cover with this class this year? Assuming, of course, that Professor Hagrid does not return. Oh, I'll take them through the creatures that most often come up an, uh, up an owl, said Prof Prof uh, Professor Grubbly Plank. Not much left to do. They've studied unicorns and nifflers. I thought we'd cover uh, porlocks and measles. Make sure they can recognize crups and, and, and gnarls, you know. Well... You seem to know what you are doing, at any rate, said Professor Umbridge, making a very obvious tick on her clipboard. Harry did not like the emphasis she put on you, and liked it even less when she put her next question to Goyel. Now, I hear there have been injuries in this class. Goyel gave a stupid grin. Malfoy hastened to answer the question. Uh, only because, no, wait, uh, that, oh, is... Oh, Malfoy. I thought Goyel would speak for some reason, but it's Malfoy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Goyel doesn't speak. He never himself. speaks. Goyel never speaks. <laughs> Look at that picture. Look at that couple. <laughs> um, Goyel gave a stupid grin. Malfoy hastened to answer the question. That was me, he said. I was slashed by a hippogriff. <laughs> Hippogriff, said Professor Umbridge, now scribbling frantically. Only because he was stu too stupid to listen to what Hagrid told him to do. Oh, stop speaking up, man, said Harry angrily. Both Ron and Hermione groaned. Professor Umbridge turned her head slowly in Harry's direction. Another night's detention, I think. Ugh, she said softly. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor Grubbly Plank. I think that's all I need here. You would be receiving the results of your inspection within 10 days. <laughs> Jolly good, said Professor Grubbly Plank, and Professor Umbridge set off back across the lawn to the castle. End of section. Owl cries leave me cold. John, zoom in next time you do Umbridge. <laughs> Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Adorbs. It was nearly midnight when Harry left Umbridge's office that night, his hand now bleeding so severely that it was staining the scarf he had wrapped around it. They're just not even going into those sections anymore. They're just like, yeah, he was writing, he was bleeding. Let's move on. <laughs> just so normal. He expected the common room to be empty when he returned, but Ron and Hermione had sat up waiting for him. He was pleased to see them, especially as Hermione was dis disposed to, what sympath to be sympathetic rather than critical. Here, she said anxiously, pushing a small bowl of yellow liquid towards him. Soak your hand in that. It's a solution of strained and pickled mu m mur murtlap tentacles. Murtlap tentacles. It should help. Murtlap tentacles. I, I, she's just throwing a whole bunch of creatures without any explanation into this now. <laughs> Harry placed his bleeding, aching hand into the bowl and experienced a wonderful feeling of relief. Crookshanks curled around his legs, purring loudly, then leapt into his lap and settled down. Oh, thanks, he said gratefully, scratching behind Crookshanks' ears with his left hand. I still reckon you should complain about this, said Ron in a low voice. No, said Harry flatly. McGonagall would go nuts if she knew. Yeah, she probably would, said Harry dully. And how long do you reckon it'd take Umbridge to pa pass another decree saying anyone who complains about the High Inquisitor gets sacked immediately? Ron opened his mouth to retort, but nothing came out, and after a moment, he closed it again, defeated. She's an awful woman, said her mother. <laughs> What's up? Read what Hillary said. Huh? Read what Hillary wrote. Umbridge thrills me. Yeah. <laughs> I aspire to that level of petty. <laughs> She's a fun character. <laughs> you guys were like, ah, oh, and I was like, get yeah. like. Umbridge? Yeah, I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, she's a she's a fun character. I, I like her, like the character of her. 
but her? No, -uh. I couldn't. Well, I wouldn't like to be anywhere near her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ron opened his mouth to retort, but nothing came out, and after a moment he closed it again, defeated. She's an awful woman, said Hermione in a small voice. Awful. You know, I was just saying to Ron when you came in, we, we've got to do something about her. I suggested poison, <laughs> said Ron grimly. No, I mean something about what a dreadful teacher she is, and how we're not going to learn any, any, defense, from, uh, any defense from her at all, said Hermione. Well, what can we do about that, said Ron, yawning. It's too late, isn't it? She's got the job. She's here to, here to stay. Fudge will make sure of that. Well, said Hermione tentatively. You know, I was thinking today... She, sh she shot a slightly nervous look at Harry and then plunged on. I was thinking that maybe the time's come when we should just, just do it ourselves. Do what ourselves, said Harry suspiciously, still floating his hand in the essence of Mertlap tentacles. They'll learn defense against the dark arts ourselves, said Hermione. Oh, come off it, groaned Ron. You want us to do extra work? Do you realize Harry and I are behind on homework again? It's only the second week. But this is much more important than homework, said Hermione. Harry and Ron goggled at her. I, I didn't think there was anything in the universe more important than homework, said Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be silly, of course there is, said Hermione. And Harry saw with an ominous feeling that her face was suddenly alight with the kind of fervor that spew usually inspired in her. <laughs> She's got something new. She's got a new cause. It's about preparing ourselves, like Harry said in Umbridge's first lesson, for what's waiting for us out there. It's about making sure we, we really can defend ourselves. If we don't learn anything for a whole year, we can't do much by ourselves, said Ron in a defeated voice. I mean, all right, we can go and look jinxes up in the library and try and practice them, I suppose. No, I agree. We've gone past the stage where we can just learn things out of books, said Hermione. We need a teacher, a proper one, who can show us how to use the spells and correct us if we're going wrong. Wrong. If you're talking about Lupin, Harry began. No, no, I'm not talking about Lupin, said Hermione. He's too busy with the order, and anyway, the most we could see him is during... Hog, Hogsmeade weekends, and that's not nearly often enough. Who then? said Harry, frowning at her. Hermione heaved a very deep sigh. <sighs> Isn't it obvious? she said. I'm talking about you, Harry. What? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, he's, he's supposed to teach him? For defense against the dark arts stuff. I, well, he's, yeah, true. He's, he's very good. He's almost died many times. Well, but and he also, died. he did a ton of training for, um, uh, the Tri-Wizard Cup. True, but... And he has real-world experience. He's successfully not died many times. Right, he's but... He's literally uh, fought Voldemort. No, I know, I know. Why, why? <laughs> I'm, but, but the thing is, he's been doing it, like, uh, he's trained and learned from the teachers, right? Yeah. But at the same time, a lot of been him reacting out of this unknown power that he has, and right? Yeah, Hermione sure, did yeah, a lot she, of it too. She definitely did uh, help a lot, but I think like, you know, they need somebody with real experience. Yeah. So, and, he, but and he's and teaching his peers who've learned the same thing he has, right? Like, what would he? Well, anyway, we no, we can see we can really, see where yeah. what he does teach him. I think him. it makes perfect sense. Yeah. I think it's so stupid. I'm not gonna read anymore. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Uh, keep reading, keep reading. Yes, yes, Jenny, I will. Don't worry. <laughs> she, he, she has almost died in five books. Mundungus would 100% be selling them. Yes, Miguel, Miguel. I, I bet there are black market Gryffindor shirts sold in Diagon Alley. Probably, that's funny. All right, um, you, you, Harry. There was a moment's silence. A light night breeze rattled the window panes behind Ron, and the fire guttered. About me what? said Harry. I'm talking about you teaching us defense against the dark arts. Harry stared at her. Then he turned to Ron, ready to, to exchange the exasperated looks they sometimes shared. When, <laughs> when Hermione elaborated on far-fetched schemes like spew. To Harry's consternation, that's a great word. Consternation, however, Ron did not look exasperated. He was frowning slightly, apparently thinking. Then he said, that's an idea. What's an idea? said Harry. <laughs> you, said Ron. Teaching us how to do it. But Harry was grinning now. Sure, the pair of them were pulling his leg. <laughs> but I'm not a teacher. I, I can't. Harry, you're the best in the year, year at, def at, at defense against the dark arts, said Hermione. Me? 
said Harry, now grinning more broadly than ever. No, I'm not. You, you've beaten me in every test. Actually, I haven't, said Hermione coolly. You beat, you beat me in our third year. The only year we both sat the tests, the test, and had a teacher who actually knew the subject. But I'm not talking about test results, Harry. Think what you've done. How do you mean? You know what? I'm not sure I want, you know what? I'm not sure I want someone this stupid teaching me. <laughs> Ron said to uh, Ron said to Hermione, smirking slightly. He turned to Harry. Let's think, he said, pulling a face like Goyel, concentrating. Uh, first year you saved the Philosopher's Stone from you know who, but that was luck, said Harry. It wasn't skill. Second year, Ron interrupted. You killed the Basilisk and destroyed Riddle. Yeah, but if Fawkes hadn't turned up, I. Third year, said Ron, louder still. You fought off about a hundred Dementors at once. You know that was a fluke. If the Time Turner, time -turner hadn't... Last year, <laughs> Ron said, almost shouting now. You fought off you-know-who again. Listen to me, said Harry, almost angrily, because Ron and Hermione were both smirking now. Just listen to me, all right? It sounds great when you say it like that, but all that stuff was luck. I didn't know what I was doing half the time. I didn't plan any of it. I just did whatever I could think of, and I nearly always had help. Ron and Hermione were still smirking, and Harry felt his temper rise. He wasn't... <laughs> he's like, you idiots don't know! He wasn't even sure why he was feeling so angry. Don't sit there grinning like you know better than I do. I, I was there, wasn't I? He said heatedly. I know what went on, all right? And I didn't get through any of that because I was brilliant at Defense Against the Dark Arts. I got through it all because... Because help came at the right time. Well, because I guessed right, but I, I just blundered through it all. I, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Stop laughing! <laughs> the bowl... <laughs> that was a really good, good, good part, good scene. The bowl of Mert Lap Essence fell to the floor. Now it's Mert Lap Essence? The, the essential oils of the Wizarding World? The bowl of Mert Lap Essence fell to the floor and smashed. Uh, wrap up. Stop, and stop underestimating Harry. He has applied the magic in real life. Yeah, true. Um, fell to the floor and smashed. He became aware that he was on his feet, though he couldn't remember standing up. Crookshank streaked away under a sofa. Ron and Hermione's smiles had vanished. You don't know what it's like. You, neither of you, you've never had to face him, have you? You think it's just memorizing a bunch of spells and throwing them at him, at him like you're in a class or something. The whole time you're sure you know there's nothing between you and dying except your own your own brain or guts or whatever. Like, like you can think straight when you know you're about a nanosecond from being murdered or tortured or watching your friends die. They never taught us that in their cl class, what it's like to deal with things like that. And you two sit there acting like I'm a clever little boy to be standing here, alive, like Diggory was stupid, like he messed up. You just don't get it. That could just as easily have been me. It would have been if Voldemort hadn't needed me. We weren't saying anything like that, mate, said Ron, looking aghast. We weren't having a go at Diggory. We, we didn't... You've got the wrong end of the... He looked helplessly at Hermione, whose face was stricken. Harry, she said timidly. Don't you see? This... This is exactly why we need you. We need to know what it's r really like facing him. Facing... Voldemort. It was the first time she had ever said Voldemort's name. And it was this, more than anything else, that calmed Harry. Still breathing hard, he sank back into his chair, becoming aware, as he did so, that his hand was throbbing horribly again. He wished he had not smashed the bowl of Mertlap essence. Well, think about it, said Hermione quietly. Please? Harry could not think of anything to say. He was feeling ashamed of his outburst already. He nodded. Hardly aware of what he was agreeing to, what of what he was agreeing to, Hermione stood up. Well, I'm off to bed, she said in a voice that was clearly as natural as she could make it. Um, night. Ron had got to his feet too. Coming, he said awkwardly to Harry. Yeah, said Harry. In, in a minute, I'll just clear this up. He in, he indicated the smashed bowl on the floor. Ron nodded and left. Repero. 
Harry muttered. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ripped it's arrow. It's pretty cheesy. It is. It is. <laughs> Rip arrow. <laughs> On Smashigus. <laughs> Harry muttered, pointing his wand at the broken pieces of China. They flew back together, good as new, but there was no returning the Mertlap essence to the bowl. He was suddenly so tired, he was tempted to sink back into his armchair and sleep there. But instead, he forced himself to his feet and followed Ron upstairs. His restless night was punctured once more by dreams of long corridors and locked doors, and he awoke next day with his star with scar prickling again. So he, yeah, he might become the unofficial teacher of the dark arts, a defense against the dark arts. Hey, don't hate on my house, important. I don't think off-brand names are allowed to improve the brand name. Uh... John is Harry, Mark is Hermione, and Mark's girlfriend, sorry, Mr. Nick, is also Hermione. Also Hermione. Yeah. We can share Hermione. <laughs> Mark is Ron. <laughs> He's probably I feel like... He's character in the whole series. Huh? He's probably my favorite character. Oh, God, gosh, I forgot to how to we drink for a second there. Hillary? <gasps> what are you talking about? Oh, my God. I didn't, I, I, I didn't even hear it, so don't repeat it. I didn't, I didn't hear it. Gosh. I generally didn't hear it. So, uh, whatever it was, Good. I didn't hear it. Uh, chapter 16, in the hog's head. <laughs> Hermione made no mention of Harry giving defense against the dark arts lesson for two whole weeks after her original detention. A suggestion. Oh, I thought she had detention too. Harry's detentions with Umbridge were finally over. He doubted whether the words now etched into the back of his hand were, uh, would ever fade entirely. Ron, sorry, yeah, there. Ron had had four more Quidditch practices, and not been shouted at during the last two. And all three of them had managed to vanish their mice in transfiguration. Hermione had actually progressed to vanishing kittens. Before the subject was broached again, on a wild, blustery evening at the end of September, when the three of them were sitting in the library looking up potion ingredients for Snape. I was wondering, Hermione said suddenly, whether you'd thought any more about defense against the dark arts, Harry. Of course I have, said Harry grumpily. I can't forget it, can we, with that hag teaching us. I meant the idea that Ron and I had. Ron, Ron cast her an alarmed, threatening kind of look. She frowned at him. Oh, all right. The idea I had then about you teaching us. Harry did not answer at once. He pretended to be perusing a page of Asiatic anti-venoms because he did not want to say what was on his mind. He had given the matter a great deal of thought over the past fortnight. Sometimes it seemed an insane idea, just as it had the night Hermione had proposed it. But at others, he had found himself thinking about the spells that had served him best in his various encounters with the dark arts and death eaters. Found himself, in fact, subconsciously planning lessons. Uh, uh, Lois supposed to get rid of what? The Lois stumped the door and bent. <laughs> Perv? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, well, he said slowly, when he could no longer pretend to find Asiatic anti-venoms interesting. Yeah, I, I, I've thought about it for a bit. And? Said Hermione eagerly. I don't know, said Harry, playing for time. He looked up at Ron. I thought it was a good idea from the start, said Ron, who seemed keener to join in this conversation now that he was sure Harry was not going to start shouting again. <laughs> Harry shifted uncomfortably in his chair. You did listen to what I said about a load of it being luck, didn't you? Yes, Harry, said Hermione gently. But all the same, there's no point pretending that you're not good at defense against the dark arts, because you are. You were the only person last year who could throw off the Imperius curse completely. You can produce a Patronus. You can do all sorts of stuff that full-grown wizards can't. Victor's, or Victor always said... Ron looked around at her so fast he appeared to crick his neck. <laughs> Rubbing it. <laughs> ah! Ah! Don't say it. <laughs> it's just, he just broke his neck just looking at her. Uh, crick his neck. Rubbing it, he said, Yeah, what did Vicky say? Ho, um, Vicky. ho, ho, said her mind. Wait. Victor? Who's Victor again? Victor Crumb. Oh, oh, right. Into Hermione. Right, right, yes, 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 yes. Okay, right. Um, 
<laughs> That's why he looked at her so fast. His, 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 his sensitivities came out. <laughs> ho, ho, said Hermione in a bored voice. He said Harry knew how to do stuff if even he, did, even he didn't, and he was in the final year at Dur Durmstrang. Ron was looking at Hermione suspiciously. You're not still in contact with him, are you? So what if I am? said Hermione coolly, though her face was a little pink. I can have a pen pal if I... He didn't only want to be your pen pal, said Ron accusingly. Hermione shook her head exasperatedly, and, ignoring Ron, who was committed to continuing to watch her, <laughs> said to Harry, Well, what do you think? Will you teach us? Just you and Ron, yeah? Well, said Hermione, looking a mite anxious again. Well, now don't fly off the handle again, Harry, please. But I really think you ought to teach anyone who wants to learn. I mean, we're talking about defending ourselves against v Voldemort. Oh, don't be pathetic, Ron. It doesn't seem fair if we don't offer the chance to other people. Harry considered this for a moment, then said, Yeah, but uh, I doubt anyone except you two would want to be taught by me. I I I'm a nutter, remember? Well, I think you might be surprised how many people would be interested in hearing what you've got to say, said Hermione seriously. Look, she leaned towards him. Ron, who was still watching her with a frown on his face, leaned forwards to listen too. You know the first weekend in October's a Hogsmeade weekend. How would it be if we tell anyone who's interested to, uh, to meet us in the village and we can talk it over? Why do we have to do it? Uh, why do we have to do it outside school? Said Ron. Because, said Hermione, returning to the diagram of the Chinese chomping cabbage, Chinese chomping cabbage, she was copying. I don't think Umbridge would be very happy if she found out what we're up to. End of bit. So they're, they're, they're inching Harry towards it. They're getting, they're getting him to do it. He's going to be like a, the secret teacher. Uh, Umbridge is going to find out the tension for everybody. All kids are going to be bleeding from every orifice. <laughs> why? Because <laughs> the tension, that's why. <laughs> Ears, eyes, nose, mouth. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, let's keep going. What time is? It? I, I'm gonna go over because obviously we we um didn't start until ten minutes in or fifty minutes in or something like that. Yeah. Thanks for that, John. Yeah. No worries. Some of us have schedules. Yeah. Very pressing matters. <laughs> <laughs> Harry had been looking forward to the weekend trip into Hogsmeade, but there was one thing worrying him. Sirius had maintained a stony silence since he had appeared in the fire at the beginning of September. Harry knew that they had made him angry by saying they didn't want him to come, but he still worried from time to time that Sirius might throw caution to the winds and turn up anyway. What were they going to do if the great black dog came bounding up the street towards them in Hogsmeade, perhaps under the nose of Draco Malfoy? Uh, Ron. Well, you can't blame him for wanting to get out and about, said Ron, when Harry discussed his fears with him and Hermione. I mean, he's been on the run for over two years, hasn't he? And, and I know that can't have been a laugh, but at least he was free, wasn't he? And now he's just shut up all the time with that ghastly elf. Hermione scowled at Ron, but otherwise ignored the slight on Creature. The trouble is, she said to Harry, until v Voldemort, oh, for heaven's sake, Ron, <laughs> He's still wincing. <laughs> Comes out into the open, Sirius is going to have to stay hidden, isn't he? I mean, the stupid ministry isn't going to realize Sirius is innocent until, until they accept that Dumbledore's been telling the truth about him all along. And once the fools start catching real Death Eaters again, it'll be obvious Sirius isn't one. I mean, he hasn't got the mark, for one thing. Ah! I, I don't reckon he'd be stupid enough to turn up, said Ron bracingly. Dumbledore would go mad if he did, and Sirius listens to, D to Dumbledore, even if he doesn't like what he hears. When Harry continued to look worried, Hermione said, Listen, Ron and I have been sounding at people who, who, we, who we thought might want to learn some proper defense against the dark arts, and there are a couple who seem interested. We've told them to meet us in Hogsmeade. Right, said Harry vaguely, his mind still on Sirius. Don't worry, Harry, Hermione said quietly. You've got enough on your plate without Sirius, too. She was quite right, of course. He was barely keeping up with his homework, though he was doing much better now that he was no longer spending every evening in detention with Umbridge. 
Ron was even further behind with his work than Harry, because while they both had Quidditch practice twice a week, Ron also had his prefect duties. However, Hermione, who was taking more subjects than either of them, had not only finished all her homework, but was also finding time to knit more elf clothes. <laughs> uh, she's just always working, she's always working. Does she ever rest? Do you ever take a break? Harry had to admit that she was getting better. It was now almost always possible to, dis to, di ugh, to distinguish between the hats and the socks. <laughs> the morning of the Hogs... <laughs> Oh, good work, good work, good, good. <laughs> the morning of the Hogsmeade visit dawned, bright, but windy after breakfast. Uh, they queued, after breakfast, they queued up in front of Filch, who matched their names to the long list of students who had permission from their parents or guardian to visit the village. With a slight pang, Harry remembered that if it hadn't been for Sirius, he would not have been going at all. When Harry reached Filch, the caretaker gave a great sniff, as though trying to detect a whiff of something from Harry. Then he gave a curt nod that set his jowls a-quiver again, and Harry walked on, out onto the stone steps and the cold, sunlit day. Uh, why was Filch sniffing you? <laughs> asked Ron, as he, Harry, and Hermione set off at a brisk, brisk pace down the wide drive to the gates. Suppose he was checking for the smell of dung bombs, said Harry with a small laugh. Ah, oh, I forgot to tell you. And he recounted the story of sending his letter to Sirius and Filch, burst, bur and Filch bursting in seconds later, demanding to see the letter. To his slight surprise, Hermione found the story highly interesting, much more indeed than he did himself. He said he was, uh, he said he was tipped off. Uh, he said he was tipped off. You were ordering dung bombs, but who tip tipped him off? I don't know said Harry, shrugging. Maybe Malfoy? He'd think it was a laugh. They walked between the tall stone pillars topped with winged boars and turned left onto the road into the village, the wind, well, the wind whipping their hair into their eyes. Whip. Whipping, the wind whipping. Wind. Whip, wind hair. the wind hair into their eyes. Malfoy, said Hermione spe skeptically. Well, yes, maybe and she remained deep in thought all the way into the outskirts of Hogsmeade. Where are we going anyway? Said Harry asked. The three broomsticks? Oh, no, said Hermione, coming out of her reverie. No, it's always packed and really nosy. Uh, noisy. I've told the others to meet us in, ho in the Hogshead, the, that, uh, that other pub. You know the one. It's not on the main road. I think it's a bit, you know, dodgy. But students don't normally go in there, so I don't think we'll be over overheard. They walked down the main street past Zonko's wizarding, jo wizarding joke shop. This is probably one of the funnest parts of uh, the the Hogsmeade um, theme park in in California. That, I, I mean, I bet they've re recreated this oh, sure. Hogsmeade. Yeah, yeah, in in the Harry Potter land or whatever it is. Yeah, that's probably the funnest one there. Uh, you, have you been? You have you, no, you haven't been. No, I, no. Oh. What's your favorite part of the, uh, in the chat, what's your favorite part of, uh, what's it called, the the Wizarding World, I guess? In California? Wizarding World? I think, yeah. What's your favorite part of it? We can play death day parties, cool. Uh, they walked down the main street past Zonko's Wizarding Shop, where they were not surprised to see Fred, George, and Lee Jordan, past the post office, from which owls issued at regular, regular intervals, intervals, and turned up a side street at the top of which stood a small inn. A battered wooden sign hung from a rusty bracket over the door. I'm sure there's going to be some kind of bartender or somebody, some character. Give me some adjectives for that person. Because I'm just sure there's going to be somebody that we haven't met yet in that place. Um, a battered wooden sign hung from a rusty bracket over the door with a picture on it of a wild boar's severed head, leaking blood onto the white cloth around it. Inviting. The sign creaked in the wind as they approached. All three of them hesitated outside the door. Well, come on, said Hermione slightly nervously. Harry led the way in. It was not at all like the three broomsticks, whose large bar gave an impression of gleaming warmth and cleanliness. The hog's head bar comprised one small, dingy, and very dirty room that smelled strongly of something that might have been goats. <laughs> the bay windows were so encrusted with grime that very little daylight could permeate the room, which was lit instead with the stubs of candles sitting on rough wooden tables. The floor seemed at first 
glance to be compressed earth. Though as Harry stepped onto it, he realized that there was stone beneath what seemed to be the accumulated filth of centuries. Harry remembered Hagrid mentioning this pub in his first year. Hagrid voice. You'll get a lot of funny folk in the hogshead, he, said, he had said, explaining how he had won a dragon's egg from a hooded stranger there. At the time, Harry had wondered why Hagrid had not found it odd that the stranger kept his face hidden throughout their encounter. What? One second. Hooded stranger. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Now he saw that keeping her face hidden was something of a fashion in the hog's head. There was a man at the bar whose whole head was wrapped in the dirty gray bandages, though, <laughs> though, he was, though he still was managing to gulp endless glasses of some, some smoking, fiery substance through a slit over his mouth. Two figures, shrouded in hoods, sat at a table in one of the windows. Harry might have thought them Dementors if they had not been talking in strong Yorkshire accents. And in a shadowy corner beside the fireplace sat a witch with a thick black veil that fell to her toes. They could just see the tip of her nose because it caused the veil to protrude, protrude, protrude slightly. I don't know about this, Hermione, Harry muttered as they crossed to the bar. He was looking particularly at the heavily veiled witch. Has it occurred to you that Umbridge might be under that? Uh, might be under that? Hermione cast an appraising eye over the veiled figure. Umbridge is shorter than that woman, she said quietly. And anyway, even if Umbridge does come in, the, in here, it, there's nothing she can do to stop us, Harry, because I've double and triple checked the school rules. We're not out of bounds. I specifically asked Professor Flitwick whether students were allowed to come in the, in, in the hogshead, and he said yes, but he, but he advised me strongly to bring our own glasses. <laughs> And I've looked up everything I can think about study groups and homework groups, and they're definitely allowed. I just don't think it's a good idea if we parade what we're doing. No, said Harry dryly, especially as it's not exactly a homework group you're plan planning, is it? The barman sidled towards them out of a, black, a back room. He was a grumpy looking old man with a great deal of long gray hair and a beard. He was tall and thin and looked vaguely familiar to Harry. What? He grunted. Three butterbeers, please. The man reached beneath the counter and pulled up three very dusty, very dirty bottles, which he slammed on the bar. Uh, Diagon, any uh, adjectives for this dude? Nothing. Nothing really. Okay, cool. Six shekels, he said. I'll get them, said Harry quickly, passing over the silver. The, the barman's eyes traveled over Harry, resting for a fraction of a second on his scar. Then he turned away and deposited Harry's money in an ancient wooden till whose drawer slid open automatically to receive it. Harry, Ron, and Hermione retreated to the furthest table from the bar and sat down, looking around. The man in the dirty grey bandages wrapped the counter with his knuckles and received another smoking drink from the barman. You know what? Ron muttered, looking over at the bar with enthusiasm. We could order anything we liked in here. I bet that bloke would sell us anything. He wouldn't care. I've always wanted to try fire whiskey. You are a prefect, snarled Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> oh, said Ron, the smile fading from his face. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, who did you say is supposed to be meeting us? Harry asked wrenching open the rusty top of his butterbeer and taking a swig. Just a couple of people, Hermione repeated, checking her watch and looking anxiously towards the door. I told them to be here about now and I'm sure they all know where it is. Oh, oh look, this might be them now. The door of the pub had opened. A thick band of dusty sunlight spilt, split, split into the room, in, split the room in two for a moment and then vanished, blocked by the incoming rush of a crowd of people. Wow. First came Neville with Dean and Lavender, who were closely followed by Parvati and Padma Patil. With, Harry's stomach did a backflip, Cho, ha <laughs> and one of her usually giggling girlfriends. Then, on her own and looking so dreamy she might have walked in by accident, Luna Lovegood. <laughs> then Katie Bell, Alicia Spinett, and Angelina Johnson. Oh, oh man! 
Colin and Dennis Creevy, Ernie McMillan, Justin Finch Fletchley, Hannah Abbott, a Hufflepuff girl with a long plate. Hufflepuff. 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 A Fluffluff. A Crumplepump. A Hufflepuff girl with a long plate, but it's P L A I T. I don't know what that word means. You know what a. P L A I T? Oh, it's a braid. Oh, it's like a braid. Like, okay. It's just a braid. It just means braid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> the long plate down her back, whose name Harry did not know. Three Ravenclaw boys, he was pretty sure were called Anthony Goldstein, Michael Corner. Michael Corner? That's a funny name. And <laughs> Terry Boot. Hey, man, are you, uh, are you, uh, Mark Doorframe? <laughs> <laughs> and Terry Boot. Ginny. Ginny, closely followed by a tall, skinny, blonde boy with an upturned nose. Whom was this? So insane. many. Whom, ha whom Harry recognized vaguely as being a member of the Hufflepuff Quidditch <laughs> team. And, bringing up the rear, Fred and George Weasley with their friend Lee Jordan. All three of whom were carrying large paper bags crammed with Zonko's merchandise. That is a lot of people. Holy smokes. I'm pretty sure at least one of them was a Pokemon there, John. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff was also there. <laughs> I am Groot. <laughs> He's also there. A couple of people, said Harry hoarsely to Hermione. A couple of people? <laughs> yes, well, the idea seemed quite popular, said Harry, uh, no, Hermione happily. Ron, do you want to pull up some more chairs? The barman had frozen in the act of wiping out a glass with a rag so filthy, it looked as though it had never been washed. So inconspicuous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Possibly he had never seen his pub so full. I said Fred, reaching the bar first and counting his companions quickly. Could we have 25 butter beers, please? 25 people, wow. The barman glared at him for a moment. Then, throwing down his rag irritably, as though he had been interrupted in something very important, he started passing up dusty butter beers from under the bar. Cheers, said Fred, handing them out. Cough up, everyone. I haven't got enough gold for all of these. Harry watched numbly, numbly, as the large, chattering group took their beers from Fred and rummaged in their robes to find coins. He could not imagine what all these people had turned up for until the horrible thought occurred to him that they might be expecting some kind of speech which he round at which he rounded on Hermione. What have you been telling people? He said in a low voice. What, what, what are they expecting? I've told you. They just want to hear what you've got to say, said Hermione soothingly. But Harry continued to look at her so furiously that she added quickly, You don't have to do anything yet. I, I'll, I'll speak to them first. Hi, Harry, said Neville, beaming <laughs> and taking a seat opposite him. <laughs> I just love Neville. I don't know why. He's, He's going to blow his own arm off. <laughs> Oh, I like this, Harry! <laughs> Harry tried to smile back but did not speak. His mouth was exceptionally dry. <laughs> Cho had just smiled at him and sat down on Ron's right... Somehow this book's lower than usual. I don't know what's going on. And sat down on Ron's right. Her friend, who had curly reddish blonde hair, did not smile, but gave Harry a thoroughly mistrustful look, which plainly told him that, given her way, she would not be here at all. Okay, who is this friend? In twos and threes, the new arrivals settled around Harry, Ron and Hermione. He blessed them. They all drank some juice and died. Ew. Ew. Uh, around Harry, Ron, and Hermione, some looking rather excited, others curious. Luna Lovegood gazing dreamily into space. <laughs> When everyone had pulled up a chair, the chatter died out. Every eye was on Harry. Uh, said Hermione, her voice slightly higher than usual, out of nerves. Well, uh, hi. The group focused its attention on her instead, though eyes continued to dart back regularly at Harry. Well, um, well, you, you know why you're here. Um, uh, well, Harry had the, had the idea, I mean... Harry had thrown her a sharp look. I had the idea that it might be good for if people who wanted to study defense against the dark arts and, I mean, really study it, you know, not the rubbish that Umbridge is doing with us. Hermione's voice became suddenly much stronger and more confident. Because nobody could call that defense against the dark arts. Um, here, here, said Anthony Goldstein. And her, is it Goldstein or Goldstein? Definitely Goldstein. Goldstein. I mean, I guess you could pronounce it anyway. Yeah, Gold, Goldstein. In German, it would be Goldstein. 
And Hermione looked heartened. Well, I thought it would be good if we, well, took matters into our own hands. She paused, looked sideways at Harry and went on. And by that, I mean learning how to defend ourselves properly. Not just in theory, but doing the real spells. Okay, so we got a couple of new characters here. A couple of new characters. Can you uh, give me some adjectives for Michael Corner? Or maybe I'll just call... <laughs> maybe I'll just call him Michael Doorframe. That's his name. For, for, for a good old Michael Corner Doorframe. Um, some ad adjectives for this dude. And then also Anthony Goldstein. And I don't know who else was new, but... Michael Corner is rigid. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so so some adjectives for those if they uh, you know pop up and say a lot of stuff you know if not I'll just make up some voices for them. Uh, Michael Corner, you want to pass your defense against the dark arts owl too though I bet said Michael Corner who was watching her closely. Of course I do said Hermione at once. But more than that, I want to be properly trained in defense because because she took a great breath and finished because Lord Voldemort is back. The reaction was immediate and predictable. Cho's friend shrieked and slopped a butterbeer down herself. Cherry Boot gave a kind of involuntary twitch. Padma Patil shudder shuddered, and Neville gave an odd yelp that he managed to turn into a cough. Oh! <laughs> oh, Neville. All of them, however, looked fixedly, even eagerly, at Harry. Well, that's the plan anyway, said Hermione. If you want to join us, we need to decide how we're going to... Uh, Michael Corner, minor, Goldstein, German. <laughs> Is he? Sorry, he's Jewish. I, th I think they're all Swedish. <laughs> uh, they're all Swedish, come on now. <laughs> uh, blonde Hufflepuff play... Where's the proof you know who's back? Said the blonde Hufflepuff player in, the rather, in a rather aggressive voice. Where's the proof you know who's back? <laughs> So the blonde Hufflepuff played a rather aggressive voice. Well, Dumbledore believes it, Hermione began. Uh, the, oh, it's just still that guy. You mean Dumbledore believes him? He's just always going to be speaking at that level. That's, the, that's that blonde character. Said the blonde boy, nodding at Harry. Who are you? Said Ron, rather rudely. Zach Zach Zacharias Smith, said the boy. Zachari Zacharias? Zacharias, Raya Smith, yeah, said the boy. And I think we've got the right to know exactly what makes him say, you know who's back. <laughs> He's a really, like, thin, gangly, blonde boy. Okay. And young. Young? Super young. young? Super young. young. Look, said Hermione, inter intervening swiftly. That's really not what this meeting was supposed to be about. It's okay, Hermione, said Harry. It had just dawned on him why there were so many people there. He thought Hermione should have seen this coming. Some of these people, maybe even most of them, had turned up in the hopes of hearing Harry's story firsthand. What makes me say you... Oh, wait. What makes me say you know who's back? He repeated, looking Zacharias... Zacharias? Is that how you pronounce that name? I've never had to say that name. Zacharias, I think? Zacharias straight in the face. I saw him. But Dumbledore told the whole school what happened last year. And if you didn't believe him... You won't believe me, and I'm, not, I'm not, and I'm not wasting an afternoon trying to convince anyone. The whole group seemed to have held its breath while Harry spoke. Harry had the impression that even the barman was listening. <laughs> he was wiping the same glass with a filthy rab, rag, making it steadily dirtier. <laughs> Zacharias said dismissively, All Dumbledore told us last year was that Cedric Diggory got killed by you-know-who, and that you brought Diggory's body back to Hogwarts. He didn't give us details. He didn't tell us exactly how Diggory got murdered. I think we'd all like to know if you've come to hear exactly what it looks like when Voldemort, Voldemort murders someone. I can't help you, Harry said. His temper, always so close to the surface these days, was rising again. He did not take his eyes from Zachariah Smith's aggressive face and was determined not to look at Cho. I don't want to talk about Cedric, Cedric Diggory, all right? So if that's what you're here for, you might as well clear out. He cast an angry look in Hermione's direction. This was, he felt, all her fault. She had decided to display him like some sort of freak. And of course, they'd all turned up to see just how wild his story was. But none of them left their seats, not even Zach Zachariah Smith, though he continued to gaze intently at Harry. And then they kissed. 
Gotcha. Where's Cody? I don't know. <laughs> so, said Hermione, her voice very high-pitched again. So, like I was saying, uh, if you want to learn some defense, then we need to work out how we're going to do it, how often we're going to meet, and where we're going to... Uh, oh, the girl with a long plate down her back. I just like imagining that it's actual plate. She's just hung a plate from her hair. It's like, just in case I need to eat. <laughs> plat. Yeah. Plat. Is it true, interrupted the girl with a long plat down her back, <laughs> looking at Harry, that you can produce a Patronus? There was a murmur of interest around the group at this. Yeah, said Harry slightly defensively. A corporal Patronus? <laughs> the phrase stirred something in Harry's memory. Uh, you don't know Madame Bones, do you? He asked. The girl smiled. She's my auntie, she said. I'm Susan Bones. She told me all about oh. your hearing. Wait, who, who's, um... Madame Bones was in the hearing. Oh, right. Yeah. It, and the... she was very interested in the fact that Harry was able to produce a full Patronus charm. Right, she was the good one. Yeah. Well, I, I'm assuming good one. She seemed like the, she, she seemed like one of the good ones. Okay. She, yeah, she was definitely nicer to him. Yeah. yeah, so it's the, uh, her, her niece. Okay. And in, in case this character pops up more often, you know, feel free to give me adjectives around her. Yeah, where the hell is Cody? Cody? Where are you? <laughs> Who the heck is Cody? <laughs> and where's Chad? Uh, he's making a joke about the sweet life of Zach and Cody. Oh. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> she's my auntie. She's my auntie, she said. I'm Susan Bones. She told me about your hearing, so is it really true? You make a stag Patronus? Yeah, said Harry. Blimey. Uh, uh, bl blimey, Harry. Looking deep, deeply impressed. I never knew that. M oh, sorry, there's so many characters. Mum told Ron not to spread it around, said Fred, grinning at Harry. She said you got enough attention as it was. <laughs> She's not wrong, mumbled Harry, and a couple of people laughed. The veiled witch sitting alone shifted very slightly in her seat. Terry Boot. Terry Boot. Also, I don't think a character we've met. Terry Boot. What's Terry Boot like? And did you? <laughs> and did you? <laughs> he sounds kind of, he sounds kind of rubbery. Though. Rubbery? Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and did you kill a bathgalith with the, <laughs> the bathgalith with a thorn in Dumbledore's office? Demanded Terry Boot. That's what one of the portraits on the wall told me when I was near last year. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I did. Yeah, said Harry. <laughs> Justin Finch Fletchley whistled. The Creevy brothers exchanged awestruck looks, and Lavender Brown said, Wow, softly. Harry was feeling slightly hot around the collar now. He was determinedly looking anywhere but at Cho. <laughs> and in our first year, said Neville to the group at large, he saved that f uh, phil philological stone. <laughs> Philoso <laughs> <laughs> Philosophers, hissed Hermione. Uh, yes, that um, from the you-know-who <laughs> finished Neville. <laughs> I can't even speak properly. <laughs> Philological stone. <laughs> Hannah Abbott's eyes were as round as galleons. And that's not to mention, said Cho, Harry's eyes snapped across to her. She was looking at him, smiling. His stomach did another somersault. All the tasks he had to get through in the tri was a tournament last year. Getting past dragons and mer people and acromantula and things. There was a murmur of impressed agreement around the table. Harry's insides were squirming. He was trying to arrange his face that, so that he did not look too pleased with himself. <laughs> the fact that Cho had just praised him made it much, much harder for him to say the thing he had sworn to himself he would, he would tell them. Look, he said, and everyone fell silent at once. I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be modest or anything, but... I had a lot of help with all that stuff. Michael Corner. Oh yeah, what, what, what is it? No, what was this thing? I don't tell you. I can't remember. Oh, oh, I can't remember these voices. So wait, wait. Which one you couldn't do without laughing? <laughs> Terry Booth like this. And then there's uh, Michael Corner, who was like, oh, I can't remember his name. I, I, I voice. I'm gonna make it up, I guess. <laughs> Not with a dragon, you did. 
<laughs> what's an actor for this guy? <laughs> uh, what, what's this William Chair? Michael Corner, <laughs> William Chair, John Lamp, Mark Bed, Hillary Wall. <laughs> uh, well, what, what is uh, Michael Corner's voice like again? Swedish. No, not with the dragon, you didn't, said Michael Corner at once. That was a seriously cool bit of flying. <laughs> Yeah, well, said Harry, feeling it would be churlish to disagree. <laughs> and nobody helped you get rid of those Dementors this summer, said Susan Bones. No, said Harry. No, okay. I know I did bits of it without help, but the point I'm trying to make is... Uh, Zachariah Smith. What was he again? Oh, man. The young one who's tall and blonde. The blonde, the blonde. Tall skin. Oh, yeah, he's the, the, the loud one. Yeah. Are you trying to weasel out of showing us any of this stuff? Said Zachariah <laughs> Smith. He has an idea, said Ron loudly, before Harry could speak. Why don't you shut your mouth? Ron. Hey, 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 shut the hell up. <laughs> Do your shots fired sound effect. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. Um, why don't you shut your mouth? <laughs> Perhaps the word weasel had affected Ron particularly strongly. In any case, he was now looking at Zacharias as though he would like nothing better than to thump him. Zacharias flushed. Well, we've all turned up to learn from him and now he's telling us he can't really do any of it. He said, that's not what he said, snarled Fred, who was saying this. Would you like us to clean out your ears for you? inquired George, pulling a long and lethal-looking metal instrument from inside one of Zonko's bags. What is he doing? Is he going to torture him? Or any part of your body, really? We're not fussy where we stick this, said Fred. <laughs> Super aggressive. Uh, uh, yes, well, said Hermione hastily. Moving on, the point is, uh, are we agreed we want to take lessons from Harry? There was a murmur of general agreement. Zacharias folded his arms and said nothing, though perhaps this was because he was too busy keeping an eye on the instrument in Fred's hands. Right, said Hermione. Right, said Hermione, looking relie uh, relieved that something <laughs> had at last been settled. Well then, the next question is how often do we do it? I really don't think there's any point in meeting less than once a week. Hang on, said Angelina. We need to make sure this doesn't clash, uh, clash with our Quidditch practice. No, said Cho. Nor with ours. Nor ours, added Zachariah Smith. He's always got his hand up, too. He was like, hey, I'm speaking. <laughs> um, I'm sure we can find a night that suits everyone, said Hermione, slightly impatient. But you know, this is rather important. We're talking about learning def to defend ourselves against v v Voldemort's Death Eaters. Well said, barked Ernie McMillan, who Harry had been expecting to speak long before this. Personally, I think this is really important, possibly more important than anything else we'll do this year, even with our owls coming up. He looked around impressively, as though waiting for people to, to cry, surely not, <laughs> when nobody spoke, he went on. I personally am at a loss to see why the ministry has foisted such a useless teacher on us at this critical period. Obviously, they are in denial, they are in denial but the return of you know who but to give us a teacher who is trying to actively prevent us from using defensive spells. We think the reason Umbridge doesn't want us trained in defense against the dark arts, said Hermione, is that she's got some, some mad idea that Dumbledore could use the students in the school as, as a kind of private army. She thinks he'd mobilize us against the ministry. Nearly everybody looked stunned at this news. Everybody except Luna Lovegood, who piped up, well, that makes sense. After all, Cornelius Fudge has got his own private army. What? said Harry, completely thrown by this unexpected piece of information. Oh, okay. Yes, he's got an army of heliopaths, said Luna solemnly. No, he hasn't, snapped Hermione. Yes, he has, said Luna. What are heliopaths? asked Neville, looking blank. They're spirits of fire said Luna, her protuberant eyes widening so that she looked madder than ever. Great, tall, flaming creatures that gallop across the ground, burning everything in front of... They don't exist, Neville, said Hermione tartly. 
Oh, yes, they do, said, her, said Luna angrily. I'm sorry, but where's the proof of that? snapped Hermione. There are plenty of eyewitness accounts. Just because you're so narrow-minded, uh, narrow you need to have everything shoved under your nose before you... Ahem, said Ginny. Oh, where did that come from? In such a good imi... Um, ahem, ahem, said Ginny, in such a good imitation of Professor Umbridge that several people looked around in alarm and then laughed. Weren't we trying to decide how often we're going to meet and have defense lessons? Yes, said Hermione at once. Yes, we were. You're right, Ginny. Uh, well, w once a week sounds cool, said Lee Jordan. As long as... began Angelina. Yes, yes, we know about the Quidditch, said Hermione in a tense voice. Well, the other thing to do is to decide where we're going to meet. This was rather more difficult. The whole group fell silent. Not a chance that John remembers a single word from this section. Of course I do! This is not a whole bunch of, like dense information of, from a news article. It's a, I remember it more when people are speaking against each other or, or over each other. Uh, not a single word as a scene you should reread. I remember it. I'll remember it. Luna, gotta love her. Um, where are we gonna do this? This was rather more difficult. The whole group fell silent. Library? Suggested Katie Bell after a few moments. I can't see Ma Madam Pince being too chuffed with us doing jinxes in the library, said Harry. Maybe an unused classroom, said Dean. Yeah, said Ron. McGonagall might let us have hers. She did when Harry was practicing for the Triwizard. But Harry was pretty certain that McGonagall would not be so accommodating this time. For all that Hermione had said about study and homework groups being allowed, he had the distinct feeling that this one might be considered a lot more rebellious. Right, well... We'll try to find somewhere, said Hermione. We'll send a message round to everybody when we've, got a, when we've got a time and a place for the first meeting. How much do we have left in this? Oh, this goes on for a while. So I'm obviously not going to finish this chapter. Uh, we'll see. Okay, I'll, I'll probably end soon. Um... Right, right, right. She rummaged in her bag and produced parchment and a quill, then hesitated, rather as though she was steeling herself to say something. I, I think everyone should write their name down, just so we know who was here, but I also think... She took, took a deep breath. That we all ought to agree not to shout about what we're doing. So, if you sign, you're agreeing not to tell Umbridge or anybody else what we're up to. Fred reached out for the parchment and cheerfully wrote his signature. But Harry noticed at once that several people looked less than happy at the prospect of putting their names on the list. Uh, said Zacharias slowly, not taking the parchment that George was trying to pass to him. Well, I'm sure Ernie will tell me when, when the meeting is. But Ernie was looking rather hesitant about signing too. Hermione raised her eyebrows at him. I, well, we are prefects, Ernie burst out. And if this list was found, well, I mean to say, you said yourself, if Umbridge finds out. You just said this group is the most important thing you do this year, Harry reminded him. I, yes, said Ernie. Yes, I do believe that. It's just, Ernie, do you really think I'd leave this, this that list lying around? Said Hermione testily. No, no, of, of course not, said Ernie, looking lo slightly less anxious. I, yes, of course I'll sign. Uh, nobody raised objections after Ernie though Harry saw Cho's friend give her a rather reproachful look before adding her own name. When the last person, Zacharias, had signed, Hermione took the parchment back and slipped it carefully into her bag. There was an odd feeling in the group now. It was as though they had just signed some kind of contract. Well, time's ticking on, said Fred, brisk Fred briskly, getting to his feet. George, Lee and I have got items of a sensitive nature to purchase. We'll be seeing you all later. In twos and threes, the rest of the group took their leave, too. Oh, actually, the chapter is done here. Oh, cool. Okay. No, two more pages. Cho made, a rather, ma Cho made rather a business of fastening the catch on her bag before leaving, her long, dark curtain of hair swinging forwards to hide her face. But her friend stood beside her, arms folded, clicking her tongue. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> So that show had little choice but to leave with her. <laughs> you know, some people do the, the awkward turtle to get a situation. Some people just click their tongues. <laughs> we gotta leave. So that show had little choice but to leave with her. As a friend ushered her through the door, Cho looked back and waved at Harry. Well, I think that went quite well, 
said Hermione happily, as she, Harry, and Ron walked out of Hog's Head into the bright sunlight a few moments later. Harry and Ron were clutching their bottles of butterbeer. That Zacharias bloke's a wart, said Ron, who was glowering after the, after the figure of Smith, Smith, just discernible in the distance. I don't like him much either, admitted Hermione, but he overheard me talking to Ernie and Hannah at the Hufflepuff table, and he seemed really interested in coming, so what could I say? But the more people, the better, really. I mean, Michael Corner and his friends wouldn't have come if he hadn't been going out with Ginny. Ron, who had been, <laughs> who had been draining the last few drops of, from his butterbeer bottle, gagged and sprayed <laughs> butterbeer down his th front. He's what? Spluttered Ron, outraged, his ears now resembling curls of raw beef. <laughs> She's going out with... My sister's going... What do you mean, Michael Corner? What? The tongue click. They said, someone teach John what a tongue click is. Well, I, I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, she's going up. My, my sister's going. What do you mean, Michael Corner? Well, that's why he and his friends came, I think. Well, they're obviously interested in learning defense, but if Ginny hadn't told Michael what was going on. When did this. When did she. They met at the Yule Bowl and got together at the end of the last year, said Hermione composedly. They turned into the high street and she paused outside Scriven Shaft's quill shop, where there was a handsome display of pheasant feather quills in the window. <laughs> hmm, I could do with a new quill. She turned into the shop. Harry and Ron followed her. Which one was Michael Corner? Ron demanded furiously. <laughs> the dark one, said Hermione. I didn't like him, said Ron at once. <sighs> Big surprise said Hermione under her breath. But, said Ron, following Hermione along a, along a row of quills and copper pots, I thought Ginny fancied Harry. <laughs> Hermione looked at him rather pityingly and shook her head. Ginny used to fancy Harry, but she gave, uh, Ginny used to fancy Harry, but she gave up, gave up on him months ago. Not that she didn't, doesn't like, like you, of course, she added kindly to Harry, while she examined a long black and gold quill. Harry, whose head was still full of Cho's parting wave, did not find the subject quite as interesting as Ron, who was positively quivering with indignation. But it did bring something home to him that until now he had not reali really registered. So, that's why she talks now, he asked Hermione. She, oh, wait, no, this, is, this is Harry. So that's why she talks now, he asked Hermione. She never used to talk in front of me. Exactly, said Hermione. Yes, I think I'll have this one. She went up to the counter and handed over fifteen sickles and two knuts, with Ron still breathing down her neck. Ron, she said severely as she turned and trod on his feet, this is exactly why Ginny hasn't told you she's seeing Michael. She knew you'd take it badly, so don't harp on about it, for heaven's sake. What do you mean? Who's taking anything badly? I'm not taking to harp on, on about anything. Ron continued to chunter, a chunter, a chunter under his breath all the way down the street. Hermione rolled her eyes at Harry, and then said in an undertone, while Ron was still muttering imp imp imprecations about Michael Corner, and talking about Michael and Ginny, what's about, what, what about Cho and you? What do you mean? said Harry quickly. It was as though boiling water was rising rapidly inside him, a burning sensation that was causing his face to smart in the cold. Had he been that obvious? Well said Hermione, smiling lightly, slightly. She just couldn't keep her eyes off you, could she? Harry had never before appreciated just how beautiful the village of Hogsmeade was. End of chapter. Harry is in love, Harry is in love. We went for an hour, well, an hour and 20 minutes. Tim and typos suck. Okay, so uh, that was just like, a, that was a lot of people in that meeting. That was a lot of people, 25. You handled it really well. Thanks, Mark. Man, I think this chat has made me relive childhood holy food waste. <laughs> I don't what? know what that means. Also, where's Corey? <laughs> Cody. Cody. Cody, not Corey. <laughs> okay, well, friends. That was, a, that was a fun read. We'll see where it goes tomorrow with Harry possibly teaching the first time or is going to maybe, maybe probably some more Umbridge stuff. That, that witch in the corner who shifted slightly. 
That wasn't Umbridge. I bet I bet it was McGonagall. It was McGonagall. Uh, that is my... Uh, I hit everything. Hey, how about this, everybody? <laughs> That's a good ending to all this, right? <laughs> all right, everybody, I'll see you tomorrow again at 6 o'clock. Friday's tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday, yeah. I'll see you tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Thanks for tuning in. Bye from me, from Mark, and from...